Bible this morning. We have some Bibles for you. Does anybody need a Bible? Slip, slip up your hand and we'll look at your Bible. Anybody need one? All right, back over here. Up over here, Roman. Angela. Genesis chapter number one. Today we're going to be, we're starting a series on the family. And uh, we're going to start it at its roots. And then we'll work up from there. You know, typically within family, husband, wife, couple, children, those types of things, and certainly that's family. We'll, we'll address that at some point. But before there ever was children, there was another family. Okay, we're almost, we all got, we got all done. Before we 
we ever have the families that God desires, we have to work on this area of fellowship with God. One of the reasons that families are fractured today is because it's something that God created, and Satan doesn't like anything that God created, and he is desperately trying to tear apart everything. Family being one of those things. Another thing about families, it pictures something more than just this internal family. It pictures a, 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 another family, a family of God, where Christ is the head, and, and we're part of his body, and uh, we're one flesh with him. God is in us, and we are in him. It's a wonderful, wonderful family to be a part of. If you're not a part of that family, you, you need to be a part of that family. And I'd be happy to talk to you after the service about how you can be a part of the family of God. If you're not born into that family, much like the family you have now, you're born into that family, but the family of God is something you have to be born again into. You be saved. You need to trust Jesus Christ your Savior. Well, some of you have bad examples all the way around you. Some of you grew up with some of those poor examples. Certainly, if we were to look at Hollywood, it, 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 it doesn't really portray the, the godly picture of what a family is supposed to be like. So where do we draw uh, this picture of what a family is supposed to be like? We have the Bible. We have the Bible. And so uh, I'm thankful for that this morning. We're going to look at this. I'm going to show you something here. Genesis chapter number 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse number 26. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. God was obviously a trinity, and he created man to be a trichotomy as well. A man is made up of a body and a soul and a spirit, much like God the, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And this enables us to worship and have a perfect fellowship with God Almighty. I don't have time this morning to, to describe every aspect of, of the Trinity and what, what, what each one of those do, but I do know that in our own body, there's certain things that allow us to worship. We can raise our hands, we can lift our voices. You know, our spirits give us personality and they, they allow us to, to sing with enthusiasm, etc. And our hearts are transcended to heaven and we begin to think about eternal things and the things that really matter. And so God created us for worship, He created us and for fellowship. So we see that God created man. It says that he made him different than any, anything else that he created. If you think about all the creation, you've got what, animals, trees, and mountains. You've got some wonderful things that he created. But man is much different than all of those things, isn't he? Man was created in the image of God. He didn't have to do that, but he wanted a special type of fellowship with man. He wanted to be able to enjoy it enjoy the presence and the, the company of, of, of each other. And so God created a man in his likeness, in his image. The Bible says, and let him, or let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. What does that mean? That means that we're supposed to have dominion. That, that means we're a steward of it. That means that, means that those things are, are, are for us. They glorify God, but they're for us. That means we don't need to spend billions of dollars trying to protect a little snail in Oregon. All, up to this time, we've all, you know, scientists have, have, have promoted, you know, survival of the fittest, but then, anyway, that's, I can't digress right now. <laughs> I, want, I want you to see verse number 28. God blessed them, and he said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish and sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God created man in a very unique way, a very specific way, in a way that he could have fellowship and inter interaction. And it is wonderful that we can have that, that God would choose to do that with us. Look at chapter 2, verse 7. <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 7. God, and the Lord formed man out of the dust of the ground. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the man became a living what? Soul. Living soul. Another thing that's different about us and animals, so why is that important? Because uh, you're going to be taught, you've been taught that you came from an ape. <clears throat> you've evolved to where you are today, and that goes contrary to what God teaches in his word. What does the word say? He just took up some dirt. And what do you do with that dirt? Breathe into it. Man became a living soul. And so we do have a soul. Animals, animals, 
there's no indication that animals go to heaven when they die. Now, some of you probably, oh, I don't know, I'm going to see little, little, you know, little spike, holy, whatever, yeah. Well, I'm sure there's going to be animals during the millennium, so you're going to be okay there, right? You know, we get so concerned about animals these days that we lose concern over people's souls. The people, right? people are valuable to God. Yeah. Hey, I'm, I'm not for abusing animals or neglecting animals. Those things are there for us to enjoy. We still have dominion. Those things are there for our enjoyment and our pleasure. Awesome. We have some great animals here on the island and around the world. But uh, I was just talking to Deshaun the other day about, uh, he was talking to a lady who was with us here. And, and he said, oh, are you the owner of this dog? And she just kind of unglued. We are not owners of the animals. The liberals today will get all worked up when they, when they, they don't even want to call adoption anymore with the animals. You are not the parent of an animal. It's whatever, man. It's just crazy. Alright, we live in a crazy world. Clear verse number 15. And the Lord took the man and he put him in the garden of Eve to dress it and to keep it. You know, there's something special about gardens in the Bible. The Lord always found a place to go in the garden to retire, to spend time in prayer. And so he put him there. He gave him a job to do. He gave him a task. And he said, But of the trees of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For the day that thou eatest of it, there, that thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, It is not good that a man should be, be alone, and I will make him a help meet for him. Well, he couldn't find in the animals, and of course, Read and created a woman. Verse number, oh, look down at the verse. Look at chapter number 3, verse 8. Chapter 3, verse 8. It says, When they heard the voice, this is Adam and Eve after they sinned, they heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden in the pool of the day. This was not something that was uncommon for them to do with the Lord. What was it? Fellowship? Up to that point, they had not sinned. Every time we saw the Lord, it was like, it's good to see it again. They would walk and they would talk about whatever. And we talked about the animals, he talked about the garden, what he's been doing in there. The Lord is so cool. They just, we need his fellowship. It's, it's not like he's desperate to get ours. He's God Almighty. I don't know how many millions of years it was just him and all his glory. I don't know. He always was, and he always will be. Where that spectrum is where he began to create things, I know not. But I do, and I know it. He doesn't need us. We need him. But there he is, enjoying fellowship with man. He's walking in the garden of us in the pool of the day. When Adam and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord. You know that sin will do that. Sin will keep you from church. Sin will keep you from God's people. Sin will keep you from the Lord Himself. Sin will keep you from His Word. Separate you from everything that's going to be in help to you. And it goes on to say here, verse number 8. Uh, from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And of course, the, the Lord God called to Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he just gives him an opportunity to get the thing right. Do you think he really wondered where Adam was at? Adam, are you hiding again? He knew, he knew where Adam was. He's giving Adam a chance to say, hey, my wife and I were screwed up. We said, here we are. We're hiding because we feel good. We're naked. Well, we're not going to go on to that, that path because there's a lot of things that we can say, but here it is the first relationship Adam and God, Eve and God. But I want to look at specifically this the same way. Adam. Because Adam was created to have this fellowship with God, and you are created as well to have fellowship with God. To spend time with Him. To enjoy His presence. One of the unique things that we get in this dispensation of grace is we get the Holy Spirit of God that comes and lives within us. Do you realize in the Old Testament they don't have, they didn't, their bodies were not a temple of the Holy Spirit of God. Ours are. But God has created all things come to me, lives within us, and we get a chance to function in a very intimate way. Before
before you got saved, you had the spirit of man in you. Yeah. You get saved, and my Bible says that you are quick and you are made alive. The Holy Spirit of God comes and lives with you. Someday your body will be redeemed, and of course your soul is seated in heavenly places. It's already there in heaven to say. But let's keep on going here. Um, I want you to take your Bibles, and I want you to look over here. First, first John chapter number one. First John. That's not the same as the book of John, the epistle of John. This is first John, really close to the book of Revelation. First John. As you're turning there, I want to read you this verse. First Corinthians one. It says here in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 9. I just want you to listen to this. It says, God is faithful by whom ye were called into the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. When God calls you into fellowship. If you're here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, He wants you to trust Him and receive Him as your Savior. He will forgive you of your sins. He will redeem you. And he will come and live within you. He desires that. Now, as a Christian, He desires His fellowship with us. He calls us into a fellowship. And so, um, we're going to talk about that this morning because this is what Adam had. Perfect fellowship. Now, the first, first John here, this epistle was written, uh, chapter 1, primarily so that we can have or know the fellowship of God and the fellowship of of the brethren. And I want you to read along here with me uh, 1 John chapter number 1, verse number 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. By the way, that word of life was there at the very beginning. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. And Jesus Christ was there in the beginning. He is uh, the word of life. Verse 2. For the life was manifested that we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that the eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us, that which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you. Now listen. That ye also may have, what's the next word? Fellowship, Fellowship with us. Who's the us? That's the brethren. That's that's John. All right, saved individuals might have fellowship with us, and truly, he says, and truly our fellowship. So when we get together, what do we talk about? Our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. One of the great things about getting together with brothers and sisters in Christ is we get a fellowship around Jesus Christ. Because that is, that is what unites us. That's what brings us together. It's our commonality. Uh, uh, one guy uh, might be into cars. Uh, another guy might be into boxing. Another guy might be into fishing. Another guy might be into gardening or vice versa with women, right? We've got all these different interests. But what brings us all here together? What brings John and Mike together this morning? What brings you guys together? That was just me. No, no, it's Jesus Christ, Amen. right? It's their love for the Lord, the change that God has made in their lives. It's Christ, it's what brings us all here this morning. Jesus Christ, we have fellowship around Him. That commonality, how strong is that? That's stronger than generally anything that we have in our initial families. We can have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and have that relationship, but it's not even the same as brothers and sisters in Christ. Because the blood of Christ unites us in a way that's greater than the blood of mankind. We have fellowship around. Now listen, it goes on to say here, and these things write me unto you, listen, that your joy may be full. Now, so so what, what are we talking about here? Fellowship between us that's around Jesus Christ that brings joy. I guarantee you, Adam looked, he was looking forward to the mornings when it was just him and the Lord. You know what? He's joyful. Lord, I'm ready. Let's have some fellowship. 
And I'll tell you what, before John, you can ever, ever be the, the husband to Susan that you need to be. Your relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be made right. You need to have wonderful fellowship with Him. And when that's right, then this is right. Same thing with Mike. And Mike, not only with Susie, but with your daughter, Zoe. Right? You want to be a good husband, a good father? Man, the first thing that we need to look at and examine the Scripture is your relationship with God. When that is right, then everything else begins to work. Not that we won't ever have problems. Right? Right. Right, Carol? Right, right. Ray? Ray was shaking his head. Yeah. They've been married long enough. They know you're going to have some ripples along the way. Man, when we're right with God and our fellowship with Him is right, we can be dealt with. We're not so ornery that our wife can't talk to us and we can't deal with it, right? But when we're not right with God, man, listen, nobody wants to approach us and talk to us about things. Right? We're, we can get ornery and hard-hearted and not reasonable and edgy, sarcastic, offensive. Right? That's what we've got to deal with, is the root of relationship with God, fellowship with Him. And praise God, it's possible, and it can continue, even if it's not good right now. You can make it better. I love that verse. Draw nigh to me, and I will draw nigh unto you. He's there. He's waiting. And He's created us for fellowship. So we're going to look at some ways to have good fellowship with Him. Because once that's right, Sam... And that's going to be right. Right? So why deal with the personal between husbands and wife and the children when this isn't right first? Okay? And, and by the way, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not emphasizing salvation in this message, but that is the first step. The best marriages are between individuals that both have trusted Jesus Christ as their Now, can these other ones work? They can work. But they're not the best. And they have a good chance of failing over the way. Some of you got saved later on in life. And now that you are saved, you have a better marriage. A longer marriage. Right? That is good. I mean, we can, there can be several examples. Just people raise my hands at this point. I just don't want to embarrass people. All right. So... With that in mind, the context in mind, let's see what is required for our fellowship with God and His children and for this fullness of joy. Okay, number one. There's three points this morning. It's really easy. Really easy. Number one, walk in mind. Walk in mind. Well, let's read here. We'll look at this. Verse number five. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is what? That God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. Now let's look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with Him, alright, we're, we're, we're walking with the Lord, but then we walk in darkness, what are we? We're liars. What? Because God is light, we cannot walk in darkness and have fellowship with Him. We're talking about having fellowship with this morning, with the Lord. And the first step is, you've got to walk in the light. Let's keep reading. And do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship. One with another. Not only with God, but even with each other. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, Cleanses us, cleanseth us from all sin. Meaning that along the way, as we're walking into the light, we may mess up along the way. We may sin along the way. But the blood of Christ is there to cleanse us, to forgive us, so that we can continue in the light. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, maybe that's somebody this morning that would claim, well, I'm not, I'm not that bad. I, you know, I don't if we say that we have no sin, we deceive our what? 
ourselves. For all had sinned and come to know the glory of God. Now, aren't you glad? I mean, Carol was mentioned this morning. The Bible talks about while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, confess them to who? Father Baker? Uh, who? <laughs> Jesus. Why him? He's the one that paid for your sins. I didn't. Right? I don't want to hear about all your sins. No man should. Unless you sin against that brother or sister and you go to them and you talk to them and get the thing right. But what you do is you go directly to Jesus Christ. Alright? If we confess our sins, He's faithful just to forgive us of our sins. And to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, then we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. My little children, these things write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who is that? Jesus Christ. The righteous. Verse 2. And He is the propitiation for our sins. Not for ours only, but for sins of the whole world. So first of all, walk in the light. When we have fellowship with God, we need to walk in light. Why? Because God is in light. If we're going to have fellowship with Him, we're going to walk alongside of Him, we're going to have to walk in that light. Look at John chapter number 1. Just hold your place in 1 John. Look at John chapter number 1. Look at verse 1. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. What does that mean? It means that the Word was there at the very beginning. All things were made by Him. Who is Him? That's the Word. Who is the Word? Jesus Christ. And without Him, without Jesus, was not anything made that was made. So He was not begotten in time. Jesus always was. In Him was life. In who was life? Jesus. And the life was the wood of men. The light of men. And the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was what? John. He came to bear witness of God. Look at chapter first John chapter uh, number two. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, John three. Sorry, John three. John three. Verse 18. John 3, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. What was that light again? That was Jesus. And men love darkness rather than what? Than light. Why, why do men like darkness rather than light? Their deeds are evil, right? You ever watch a kid do wrong right out in the open? Generally, they're sneaky. Where do they get that from? You. <laughs> it's in each one of us, isn't it? Yeah. I, I never see a bar with all these windows around it, bright lights, and happy hour all day long. It's usually a dark, dim place. Smokes kind of float around about eye level. But people hang out in corners. Why? Because men love darkness. Why? Because the deeds are evil. More sin goes on once the sun goes down than when it comes up. But I think we're starting to reach a new level. For men are not ashamed to sin as much. They're not afraid of hiding their sin. 
to bring it all out in the open and flaunting it. Keep reading here, verse number 20. For everyone that doeth evil needeth the light. All right, now, who's the light? It's Christ. If Christ is in you, the light of the world is in you, right? And sometimes when you have a good testimony, you're trying to shine forth that light, men are not going to like that, right? Isn't that what it's saying as well? Neither come up to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. <laughs> I don't want to talk to you because you're some God lover. And you're going to just point to Jesus Christ. And, hey, I don't want to hear all the religious stuff. And you tell me I'm a sinner and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's what people need, right? You need to hear the gospel. All right? But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest. David said, search me, O God, try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Examine me, show me. But I, I, I want to do right. I want to get these things right. Is there something I'm not doing right? Am I going down the wrong path? Do I, I think I'm something wrong? I mean, Lord, show me. But they are wrought in God. Okay. Now, think about what we're in Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to move along a lot faster. Alright, so if we're in a fellowship with God, we've got to walk in the light because He is in that light. If we're going to have fellowship with other brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to walk in that light as well. Why? Right? Because they're walking in that light. They're walking in the path the Lord has set before them. If we're going to have fellowship with them, we need to do the same thing. Look at Ephesians 5.8. Ephesians 5.8. For you were sometimes darkness, but now... Are ye light in the Lord? Praise the Lord. Walk as children of light. Alright, so once you were lost, you were in darkness, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, you're children of disobedience, but now you're saved, you're born again. You're children of light, now he's saying walk in that light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, proving that what is acceptable unto the Lord. So the Lord will show you. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Ooh, people don't like that. When we're talking about witnessing to people, and generally people will listen to a point, but where they'll turn you off is when you begin to deal with sin. And now they deem you judgmental. But you're just calling ace to an ace and space faith. Alright? Proving what is acceptable in the Lord. You have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. And so if people are doing something that are wrong, don't participate in their actions. Right? Alright? Ladies, get off work. Ladies are hitting the bar. Hey, come on out with a drink. And we're going to just, we're just going to talk about it. Well, maybe that's not the best environment to go to. Right? Right? So you're going to be invited to situations and sleepovers and places and all kinds of different events. You've got to figure out what is right and acceptable in the eyes of the Lord. You're now a child of light. You're walking that light. If you want to have fellowship with God, wherever you go, just make sure you understand you're bringing Him with you. All right, Lord. Someone invites you. Hey, do you mind? I, I appreciate the invite. I'm bringing God with me. Do you mind? Do you have a place to bar with, you know? We're going to talk to you at the same time. What are you talking about? <laughs> All right. It says in verse 10, proving what is acceptable in the Lord. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You know, shh, oh, did you hear what, you know, she did last night, did you hear what he did last night? Oh, well, hey, I don't want to hear it, right? I don't want to go down that path, right? Because I'm a child of God. And I'm going to walk this way, and I'm not going to go this way or that way. Lord, guard my ears and my eyes. I want to be right. I want to have fellowship with you more than these people. All right? And all these things reproved, that are reproved or made manifest by the light for whatsoever doeth, for whatsoever doth made manifest is light. All right. 
Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee life. Okay. So what does this mean to walk about? It means not yielding to sin and confessing that sin which you have sinned. Lord, I've sinned. I've done wrong. Lord, forgive me. I want to walk in the way that you have me to go. So that's the first step to have fellowship. And secondly is this. Look back over here. First John. The second thing is keeping His commandments. Now, I understand that we're not under the law for righteousness' sake because Christ is the end of the law for righteousness, right? Once we receive Christ, we get His righteousness. It's imputed to us. It's given to us. I understand that. But the law is still not wrong. It's not just the Ten Commandments. The whole law is good. There's, there's things that point to the fact that we need Him, and there's some things there about the law that are righteous and good. The Bible talks about it here. Look at verse, uh, verse number 3 of chapter 2. And whereby we do know that we know Him if we, if we keep His commandments. All right? So if you follow up the, the Word, God, right? You follow the commandments of God, um, you're going to have fellowship with Him. Hereby we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He that saith, I know Him, and keepeth not His commandments, is a liar. And the truth is not in Him. It's just like what we just read about. If you say you're a Christian, but you don't walk in the light, something's not right. If you say you're a Christian, you want to have fellowship with God, but you're not willing to follow the Word of God, something's not right. You see that? Verse, verse 5. But whoso keepeth the Word... In Him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in Him. He that saith he abideth in Him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in Him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shines. Okay, so keeping His commandments, keeping His word, that's just part of having fellowship with Him. Um, there, are two, there are two things that we're going to look at here as far as commandments, two main ones. Look at 1 John chapter 3, just to the right. Two commandments that help you walk the way that you ought to in order to have fellowship with God. Look at 1 John 3, verse number 23. And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son of God, or the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Alright? So the liberty that we have in Christ does not allow us to supersede His Word. Oh, I've got liberty, I can do whatever I want. No, that, that's not necessarily true. We have liberty. But we place ourselves under the authority of God's Word. We live by that. And, uh, and within the context of God's Word, we have certain liberties. Um, look at James chapter number 1, and then we're going to get to the last point here. James chapter number 1, just to left a little bit. James 1, verse number 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty... Continuing therein, he be not forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his hands. And the Bible says that we're not supposed to be just here as we do. Alright, so the first point is what? Walk in the light. The second point is to keep this commandment. You know, follow after the word. Uh, allow us to, to lead you. What's the third thing? The third thing is this. We read this in St. Back over here, 1 John chapter number 2, verse number 8. Again, a new commandment I, uh, I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the true light not shining. He that saith he is in the light, and he that his brother is in darkness even until now. So the first thing was, see, you're a Christian, you don't walk in light, something's not right. You see, you're a Christian, you don't abide by the word of God, something's not right. You see, you're a Christian, but you hate your brothers, and eh, something's not right. In order for us to have perfect fellowship with God, obviously, first you need to say, we need to walk in the light, we need to be following the Word of God, we need to have a love for the brethren. A love for the brethren. Let's keep reading here. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. 
but he that hated his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are, for, are forgiven, are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children, because you have known the Father. I have written unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. And I have written unto you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you overcome that wicked one. So, and so there needs to be a love for the brother. It's connected to walking in that light. This world can get awfully lonely if it's just us and the Lord. But God has put a bunch of people around us. He's given us the body of Christ to enjoy, to, to sharpen one another, to enjoy that fellowship. All right. What does is, what is the law for the brother look like? Look at 1 John chapter 3, just to the right. What does the law for the brother look like? 1 John 3, verse 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life. Alright, so you understand what the love of God is. What is it? It's demonstrated at the cross. He died for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for what? For the brother. Alright, so there's a mutual love there. We take the love that God gave to us, and we shed that blood in our hearts, and we, 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 we let that flow to our brothers and sisters in Christ. Look at verse 17. But whosoever hath this world's good, and seeth his brother hath need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Meaning, if you see someone, a brother, that's in need, and you have means by which to help them, and you refuse to do it, something's not right. Either, either your material things have got such a hold on you, or you're so you're, you're not walking in that way. You have no fellowship with God. All right, look at verse number 18. My little children, let us not love in word. Oh, I love you. I hope, I hope you get through the week, you know, on nothing. I mean, you don't have any food. I hope it works out for you. I'll pray for you. You see, okay, your words can only go so far, right? At some point, you gotta, you got to do something more than just talk. If it's within your power to do something. Look at verse 18. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. All right, so there's some things that you can do. Um, look at 1 John chapter 4. What is this? What does this love for the brethren look like? It looks like this. Alright, Lord, thank you for giving to me. How can I distribute and give a lesson to somebody in this room? That means you've got to be proactive. I mean, okay, listen, if I remember in the, I'm probably not going to have to call you up, John, said, oh, wait a minute, I'm on my last night of wrong meals. I'm a guy. I'm not going to do that. Right? And most guys here are that way. So that's, that means that we need to be praying, Lord, if there's somebody I can give a blessing to. I'm not going to show the love of Christ to other people. Is there somebody I can give a blessing? Help them out. Uh, write them a letter. Uh, maybe it's an emotional thing and words are fitting. Prayer is fitting. Encouragement, that's fine. But there's a physical need and you have a means by which to help that brother or sister in Christ. Do it. Or if you don't know about it, or I got a little extra. I got an extra 20 bucks this week. Maybe I can buy somebody a, a burger. It doesn't go far, right? I mean, build these days, you know, 12, 13 bucks to your average, just whatever, right? It used to be you can get a burger and fries and a Coke for five bucks, four bucks. Now, now it's just crazy. Anyway, you get a little extra, how can you give us some stuff? What are we doing? We're showing the love of Christ. All right, look, First John, or, or no, yeah, First John chapter 4, verse 20. I'm just saying, they're generally not going to just fall into your lap. You've got to pray about it. You've got to look for that opportunity. And I'll tell you what, once you start down that path, it is a blessing. It's a blessing to give. It's a blessing to be a blessing to somebody. It's, it's way more fun to give it out to them than it is to get it. 
can I give you a little something? Oh, how can I, how can I give you a little something? And this is the best group to start with. Don't neglect the brothers and sisters in Christ because there's so many needs out there. You know, what did Christ say? Well, you have the poor with you always, right? You don't even have those in need out there. There's something special about your brothers and sisters in Christ. And the Bible tells us that that is our first responsibility. I'm all for helping the homeless and helping those that are in dire straits out there. Yeah. Yes. But sometimes we have them right here. If a man say, I love God, that'd be almost everybody here, right? Love the Lord? Amen. I love God, but he hates his brother. Uh oh I love you, Lord. Oh, I hate that. That guy over there, right? He just, he just drives me crazy. Every time he comes to the church, that look on his face. Ah. Or that lady right over there, she looks at me, and obviously she's having a bad day. Ah, yeah. Or that person over there, they took my parking spot. They took my chair. <laughs> or I'm always bringing food. I see them. They, they, all they do is eat the food. They never bring any food. All oh, they <laughs> Whatever it might be. The man say, I love God. You love God, right? Yeah. When somebody gets on your nerves, hates his brother. He's a liar. The need of love is not his brother who he has seen. And that brother, that brother saved. It's a brother. Saved, forgiven, been extended the grace of God. God loves that person, and if God loves him, He that loved not his brother whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment has been from him that he who loved God, love God, love God, and then love the brothers. You know what you do? Huh? Praise the Lord. God made all kinds of different creatures. Some of them get on my nerves, and I'm trying to get on other people's nerves, so we'll just work it out, you know. We'll just love each other and be gracious with each other and give each other some space and some cushion and put up with their little things. We all have them. Except for the pastor. I don't have any. I can't have any. What are we talking about this morning? This is starting out on a series of, on the family. It starts out with fellowship. That's where Adam started. Perfect fellowship with God. You know what he did? Adam just walked in the light of the day. Who was it? Jesus Christ walking with him. And he kept his commandments for a while. Right? And during that while, he, he took care of the garden. He didn't eat of that fruit. Perfect fellowship. And then sin entered. But thankful, thank, thankful we have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cleanses us and forgives us. Why? So we can get right back to that perfect fellowship. When our fellowship is right, then I can deal correctly with her. If, if my relationship with God is right, I have a better attitude. And we can approach our problems and our differences better. Say, stay on it. I'm the man of God. I'm following after God. You just got to follow me. Give me this word to God. We can talk to her. We can exchange. We can uh, overcome those obstacles together. When I'm right with God, when she's right with God, she's following the Lord. She's in fellowship with God. She's done reading her Bible and praying in the morning. I'm done reading my Bible and praying in the morning. Hey. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. She can tell when I have bread. I can tell when she has bread. Right? We're walking 